everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited. I have a guest with us today. His name is Luke Eastwood. And I never talked about this topic before, and I thought it would be very interesting to delve into. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about this topic as well. And I thought for clarity's sake, it would be good for Luke to be able to explain that to us and also talk about his books and his recent book called A Path Through the Forest. It's a collected essay on druidry. And that's a mouthful, as we just said, Luke. Luke, thank you so much for joining us. So if you can tell folks who you are, how you got to this point um, in your life, what attracted you to Druidism, and uh, just let's get get started with uh, with that. So take it away, Luke. Thank you very much for having me, first of all. Um, yeah, it is, um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack. It's a bit of a complicated subject, I suppose, in some ways. So anyway, yeah, I'll start with about myself. Um, yeah, I was raised as a Roman Catholic and uh, I didn't really question that at all till I was about 15. I went to visit my uncle and aunt and um, I suppose I was curious. I saw this Buddha figure like the, you know, uh, the fat laughing Buddha with the big huge ears. And I thought, God, what's that all about? Anyway, so he explained to me a bit. He was very interested in Japan anyway. Um, and well, he'd actually stolen a copy of a Dharma putter from a Japanese hotel, which is not a very Buddhist thing to do. But anyway, he brought this copy back with him. Mate, I don't know if he realized that you're not supposed to take them. You know, the same way you're not supposed to take the Bible that's left in a, you know, locker in a hotel. You know, you know it's just there for you to read, not for you to take home. Anyway between the jigs and the reels, he ended up with this copy of the Vodharma Pada and he lent it to me. So that kind of oh, blew my mind, really, because it was so different from the Christian Gospels. Although the message there is actually very similar to the teachings of, of, of Jesus, um, but taken from a slightly different angle, but it's very much about, you know, peace and uh, treating other people with humanity and kindness, um, which is very much the core message of Christianity. Um, so that that really impressed me. But it it not only just showed me there was another way, but it it opened my mind to the idea that there could be several different ways of um, experiencing God or spiritual life, etc. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's quite a few religions that would be, you know, they have their monotheistic God and they say, this is the only way. And if you don't adhere to this, then you're going to burn in hell. Or that's it. You'll be obliterated, whatever, you know. And I've come to the opinion that that that's not, not right. That uh, there are many different ways to experience, uh, you know, the Godhead or the divine, whatever you want to call it. I mean, we we put a human face on what we call God, generally speaking, because we don't know any better. Um, I think when you act, if you have an experience that's sort of of a sort of um, ethereal sort of uh, a sort of Gnostic nature, it, it's it's impossible to describe it. You can't really kind of express in human language what, what God actually is. Um, but in order to have religion, in order to have some kind of uh, understandable sort of uh, way of worshipping something, we, we've had to create religions which have a, a face. And... Um, Later on, I, I came across some Celtic culture, uh, a Celtic religion, which I tended to think of something as a past. I mean, I grew up, uh, you know, knowing it a bit, a bit about about Scotland where I was born and the sort of Arthurian legends of of, of England, Wales. Uh, but I never really kind of thought of paganism or, the, you know, the and the survivals of paganism being something that was sort of relevant to 
the current day something you could actually get involved with here here and now in the, the you know the the this would have been like the the late 20th century at the time you know uh I suppose my late teens coming up to about 20 years old and I kind of first got interested in in all this stuff in a, a serious way so are you in Scotland as we speak no no I live in Ireland uh in Kerry in um, the southwest Ireland I only I you know I didn't live in Scotland for very long um you know I've um you know I've been back a few times but uh um you know, my my I don't really have a whole bunch of memories from Scotland really. Um so the last time I was there when I was a kid was when I was seven, you know, on a holiday, you know. Um and then I've been back as an adult, mostly to, to Glasgow. But uh anyway, um I uh I I suppose most people in, in the UK and Ireland would be you know tend to regard these things as something that belongs in the past in the pre-christian era but when you you look into it you realize that an awful lot of um christian practice especially in ireland has actually been sort of appropriated or borrowed from 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 paganism a huge huge amount of what people do in their sort of uh, catholic practice uh, actually comes from from before from an you know the time before Christianity uh, came to the, the British Isles and to Ireland. Um, so it was quite shocking discovering that. Um, and I found that it's it's not as dogmatic as you know say the the Roman Catholic Church which I was in, you know involved in. When there was a question of something that didn't make sense to you, the priest would always just say, "Oh, it's just it's a matter of faith." you know, and you just have to accept it. Mm. You know, there was no, like, trying to give you a, an irrational or metaphysical explanation for why for why it's the way it is. You just said you've just got to accept it, and that's it. And, you know, if you don't, then it's sort of your... You're kind of basically bad, because you, you, your faith is weak, is what they imply. Yeah, um, I grew up Catholic as well, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, I have nothing against Christianity at all. Uh, in fact, I very much uh, like the teachings of of Jesus. But I wouldn't call myself a Christian. I'm a pagan. But I still have huge respect for Jesus' teachings, especially some of what's not in the Bible, like the Gospel of Thomas, which for some very strange reason was left out, despite the fact it's it's entirely the teachings of Jesus himself, his own words, yet it was left out, um, which doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the Roman takeover of Christianity back in the time of Constantine. Right. And, and it's quite bizarre because you have a what was a pagan um, empire at that point, and they had a pantheon, they had many different gods, which is very common in in paganism and they just decided to get rid of it all and replace it with with one mm. and uh, they transformed jesus from something what of a rebel and a uh, a spiritual leader uh into into a god man you know i think they had realized that um you know caesar as a god wasn't very believable for a lot of people in the empire but when you transform this, this jesus character into uh, a divine person based on um very many different things it's got elements of roman paganism mythicism even the, the cult of isis and um, horus you know the the mother and the baby jesus you know, Mary, that, that's almost a carbon copy of yeah. ISIS. Yeah, um, I read that before. Did you believe it? You've got little bits of, <coughs> uh, in, in Ireland, you've got bits of Celtic, uh, Druidic paganism that have survived. And just as you'll find, uh, if you if you go to modern-day Canada, there's, there's churches there where 
they have images of you know the blessed virgin with baby infant jesus and it's a school holding a baby in a papoose and they have like crosses which have been done in a sort of native american style on the you know on the walls of the church i've seen a video uh, and i've seen a like a an articles a photo journalist done about all about this and mm -hmm. uh, so you know what you've seen in the history of the church is adaptation and a sort of assimilation of local elements in order to sort of get the populations in different areas to mm -hmm. absorb the new religion and that's what happened in britain and that's what happened in ireland and especially in ireland and also scotland you have a huge amount of survivals of the the earlier pre pre-christian religion which um, may not have just been Druidism. Uh, the Druids were like an elite class uh, in Irish society at the same level as kings, and they were so very much sort of equivalent to like cardinals, if you like, or almost like popes, you know. But um, that's not to say that that's the only religion that existed. There may have been many different cults in pre-Christian Ireland, but we we really don't know for sure because most of the books that were extant or existing at the time of uh, St. Patrick arriving in Ireland, which is about, you know, the early 400s, they were all destroyed. They were all burned. Mm -hmm. um, there's this myth going around that the, the Irish were illiterate at that time. And they only adopted writing uh, as a result of Christianity. But that's an absolute lie. Um, it's recorded in the uh, ancient annals about um, Cormac McCart um, ordering that all of the knowledge of, of the Druids and of uh, history, or you know, all the, the knowledge of, of Ireland be written down into books. And this is long before... Uh, Christianity arrived in Ireland. And there's, of course, the yeah. own alphabet, which, according to official sort of government sources, sort of started around 400. But there's huge evidence to suggest it's much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's mentions of Ohm, the Ohm writing language, uh, in, um, you know, the old myths that are going back like, you know, one or 2,000 years, possibly before Christianity arrived in Ireland. So um, it's quite a complex situation where you've got sort of um, one one religion just sort of plonked itself on top of another one and tried to erase what was there before, or what they've very much done is sort of absorb huge elements of it, including even a lot of the um, the ancient sites. Uh, churches have been built on uh, existing sites that have been there for who knows how long, and just sort of rebranded re as uh, as Christian. Yeah. This was all a great mystery to me. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I had no idea, you know, in my in my teens that all this had happened. Uh, and I would say the average person probably doesn't actually realize any of this has happened. Oh no, guaranteed not. Let let's define what Druidism is, because if you if you Google it and get a definition of it, it says that Druidry is also known as Druidism. It's a modern spiritual and religious movement that emphasizes a connection with nature, the earth, and the natural world. Druids believe in the divine nature of the earth and strive to develop honorable relationships with nature, the land, and all living things. But yet, so I'm going to ask you to define what Druidism is, but also um, I think if you could talk to us about the connection between that and paganism, because when people hear the word pagan, they associate it with witchcraft, witchery, that kind of thing. So maybe you can start with, give us your definition of what it means to be a Druid and its connection to paganism. And then is there a connection to witchcraft? Yeah. Well, that definition is at least partially right, you know. Um, 
there are there's different types of druids there um there's a hereditary druid from wales i know very very uh erudite academic person as well as actually being a druid who's specialist in sort of celtic studies and uh he he would not worship a god as such. I suppose to him, nature itself is is divine. Is is there is his god? So there are particular types of druid who would do exactly that. They recognize sort of a, sort of an, an animistic world in that the world is animated by by the source or the godhead or spirit, whatever you want to call it, and it lives in every part of the universe in all living things um but then there's other types of druids who are uh a lot more a lot more sort of polytheistic or you know the sort of what the traditional view of paganism is as polytheistic where you've got you know 10 or 12 gods or even hundreds of gods and these all have a like a tend to have a human face um Although in reality, I think that's more for the sort of uh, congregational kind of uh, type person. I would say people in a sort of priestly caste, which is basically what a druid is, would sort of see it as just a, um, I suppose, like a portal or a sort of effigy, an image, an icon. It isn't actually, you know, a statue of Lou for instance, or Bridget, isn't actually how these gods or spirit or energy, whatever you want to define them as, they're not actually like that exactly. It's just a convenient sort of way of sort of um, connecting with it or uh, giving you something to focus on. The actual reality of what the divine is, as I said, is not anthropomorphic. It's not human-like. It's just... For us to work with these things, it's so much easier if you put a human face on things. So you've got, you know, you've got even today, even Christian druids, I even know of a, a Jewish druid, uh, you know, Buddhist druids. Uh, it's kind of morphed into a thing where you can be almost any type of a druid. But to, to me, it's a pagan spirituality. And in the past, it was absolutely 100 percent pagan you'd have to remember that the you know the the christians of the 400s plus you know and but earlier in the uk were absolutely at war with the druids they're opposed to them the early roman conquests of britain had been trying to eliminate the druids not because of their religion but because they were also spiritual and sort of um political military leaders too i mean didn't get involved in fighting that much generally but they would have been a very strong motivational force so um when when R the roman empire became christian it continued to persecute uh the druids in gaul and in uh um in britain too a anywhere else would have been in spain before that but they'd probably been eliminated by that point i think it took around till i think the late 400s um the gaulish language was wiped out in france is what what's now france and the druids with them they were just gone completely and they were pretty much eliminated in most of britain you had uh, some fringes of wales and scotland where they survived sort of mostly in secret and in ireland it had continued on fettered really up until the arrival of patrick um and it took about 400 years for for paganism and druidism to die out in ireland which is another thing that you you know if you look at a government website or a catholic website they'll tell you you know just like that st patrick arrived and everyone converted to become a christian that's absolutely wrong in fact the archaeology proves that that's untrue because the way people were buried in it's two different, very obviously different styles of burial between Christians and pagans in Ireland. So you know straight away whether it's a Christian burial or pagan burial. There's no disputing it. And these still existed around 800 AD 
there's there still were some pagan graves that, that have been created at that time. So uh, that's a big lie that it just went away straight away. But the original Druids would have all been pagans. They may have had one god or they may have just revered nature or they might have had like 100 gods or 20 gods or 12 gods. But basically they would all be um, worshipping outside in, in the trees, in groves. They would be revering nature. They would be very much in tune with the natural world. And their the magic that they would have performed would have been very much based in nature itself, uh, as opposed to sort of like a, what you call hermetic magic, which is somewhat more complex and not so based in in the natural world, although it does incorporate the, the four elements, the traditional four Neoplatonic elements. A lot of uh, what you'll see in hermetic magic is quite sort of ceremonial and complicated and not so steeped in the natural world as sort of druidic magic would be, which is a lot in common with sort of um, indigenous shamanism in many ways, although it isn't the same thing. It, they're not, you know, they're not um, exactly comparable, but there would be similarities. So um, you were going about witchcraft and paganism. Yeah, what has happened is over time, um, particularly... Um, the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have all demonized paganism and equated it with Satanism and evil. Really, just really to try and get rid of it, not because there is any actual associations uh, with that. And the, the sad thing about it really is they actually uh, created Satanism themselves. Um, and you have got in the history of of magic, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages onwards, a branch of witchcraft that that is satanic, and that may be people who felt oppressed by the church, etc. For God, God knows what crazy reasons, actually went off and did start working in that way. You know, it's well documented in history. But you know, the ancient forms of paganism, which uh, we inherited have got absolutely nothing to do with the devil or Satan or anything like that. But then you have a demonization of magic in itself because um, it was kind of anathema that the idea that you could actually connect with God yourself, um, that you could actually affect the natural world through God sort of maybe working through you that you might be able to do things like prophecy through, you know, uh, the energy or power of a god or goddess coming into you. Um, that was so anathema to the church, which wants you to go and have a sole person who would be your conduit between God and you, would be the Catholic priest. Is that so, the type of magic that you're talking about? Like these these rituals, um, you, you call them magic, but when we hear the word well, magic, yeah. it, it's a little They're, confusing. Magic can involve generally often does involve ritual, not always. There's sort of you can do some sort of simple, I suppose, spellcraft. It doesn't even that in itself is sort of like a mini ritual, if you like, you know. But then you look at you know Catholicism, how ritualistic it is. They, you know, it does incorporate huge elements of what would have been viewed as magical if it wasn't for the fact that, uh, you know, the Catholic Church says, well, this is this is normal and anything else is just right. Uh, oh, uh, evil. It's it's magic. It's witchcraft. But I mean, if you look at the elements within within the mass that, you know, uh, transubstantiation this transformation of you know, the body and blood, uh, you know, from bre bread and wine. <laughs> if that's not magic, I don't know what is, you know. Um, it, what they have tried to do is sort of shoehorn everything into this one conduit. So if you want to be at one with God, you've, you've got this very, very narrow way, which is to go through 
the priest. The priest is the only sanctioned and approved method of, of um, having any communion with God. Of course, you're allowed to pray, but you know, um, it, it's a it's a form of control. The individual gnosis or uh, connection with um, with God has been very much frowned upon. Even if you look at some of the sort of people like. St. Francis, uh, his order was nearly exterminated, you know. He was very fortunate that the Pope at the time actually approved him. A lot of the cardinals wanted him killed, they wanted him got rid of. Uh, and people like Padre Pio, and there is his, his uh, various um, people who've had visions like Fatima and etc. Um, you know, the church hierarchy has very much... Um, frown upon these people maybe reluctantly embrace them because they these characters are so hugely popular with with the public that they really couldn't really just kind of get rid of them they had to embrace them but this whole idea of having a, a personal connection with deity with the divine is something that a lot of um these sort of power obsessed religions don't they don't like they don't like that uh, they like to have a priesthood and they want to have a pyramid structure with the boss at the top and then like the next level of bosses and then you've got the sort of everyday priesthood at the bottom. Uh, it's a structure that's very powerful and also a great mechanism for collecting money off of people. I mean, don't get me wrong, the ancient druids actually were paid, but they would have been paid by the local chieftain or by the king. In Ireland, you had a strange structure where you had uh, five provinces and each had its own provincial king. And you had what was called the Ard Ri or High King, who was king over the entire country. Um, but each level of, of sort of chief and then the kings and then the High King all had their own druids. And they used to pay them. They were quite paid very handsomely. And they would sort of do things like uh, keep the chronology of the family and recite all that. And they would write poems in praise of their king and, uh, you know, battle victories and write, you know, an epic poem about that, etc. So a lot of it involves what we call bardic arts, which is sort of creativity. And they would pay, be paid huge amounts of money for that. They'd also do things like write horrible satires about their, you know, the king's enemies or something. It was actually believed that a, a particularly nasty satire might cause someone to die. Um, so it was sort of a form of magical poem, if you like, like almost like like a curse, really. Um, so um, it's 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 a like a complex situation, really, where you have got sort of. Uh, elements of magic which are part of everyday life within druidism but it's somewhat different from the idea of the you know the witch that you see um on the tv and of course um the knowledge of herbs and such like that and how to use magic is very much part of the druidic arts but there's so much more than that a lot to do with history to do with healing to be judges uh to you know uh, create and sort of administer law as well that was one of the functions but like the the witch has been sort of uh wrongly and rightly demonized in that many witches in the past would have been um at what they call ambivalent and that they just do what they're paid for some of them uh i suppose even today you could go and see uh, someone who's practicing witchcraft and ask them to put a curse on somebody. Some of the more kind of ethically minded will just tell you to go away. But there would be some who would just say, okay, that's, you know, that's $300. Who do you want right. me to curse? You know, uh, there's a modern kind of misconception, especially uh, in some, some circles that all witches are great. They're all good and they're lovely and they never do anything bad. But, uh, a, a witch could would learn how to heal you, and they also might learn how to kill you as well. Right. So, as part, if you if you look at the history of magic, you look at what's called a grimoire, 
or a book of shadows and such like you'll find spells in there for healing for love for for telling the future for all kinds of things but you also find curses in it so it's not it's not clear cut it's not a thing it's all really down to the individual and to your personal ethics you it's i the analogy i would be you use quite often be if you put a knife into the hand of a chef they'll use it to prepare a wonderful meal if you put that same knife into the hand of a murderer they'll go out and kill people so it's not really about it's not the techniques uh, that's the problem it's the mind of the person right if you're a bad person if you learn how to do magic you're going to use it to do bad things and if you're a good person um you're going to do good things with it. That's why I think ethics is one of the number one things that needs to be taught in Druidism and in all uh, sort of esoteric or magical paths. Right. Well, I think every culture has that. I mean, you have voodooism and with mm. similar. I mean, I, I guess across the globe, it's it's very similar. So what's it like for Druids in Ireland today or anywhere across the globe um, do they have a community, a church? Like, tell folks what it's like for you to be a Druid. Are you connected to this community? I know in your book you talk about that in great detail. So what what's it like for you? Because, like, for Catholics, you, you go to church on Sunday, pray every day, and try to be a good Christian. What's it like for a Druid? Well, um... I can really only talk about myself because people have different ways of doing things. So I have individual practice that I do every day, prayers and exercises I might do. But then you like to get, a, get together with other people. Generally, what Druids do is meet in what's called a grove, which is could be just a clearing in a forest. It could be in a park. It could be a stone circle if you're fortunate enough to live close to one of those. Um. And then you get sort of bigger groupings every now and then. You tend to, there's sort of eight special festivals in the sort of uh, pagan and druidic year. And people often meet up for those. And uh, you can also become part of a, like a, a group, often called a grove, or a bigger, like, well, a druid order, you know, uh, which could be national or international. Um, so they have you know, big get-togethers where people from all over the country or even mm, several different countries will get together. And uh, But you don't actually have church as such. Now, there are a couple of, sort of pagan churches that have come into existence where that you have a building for, you know, for ritual and ceremony. But as a general thing, most druids would meet outside. Nearly, I mean, I I think I'd probably say ninety nine point nine percent of meetings I've been at have been outside. That would be the normal thing, you know. So you have your sort of equivalent of a mass outdoors in a, in a natural setting, you know. And if you live in a city, you probably have to go to somewhere like a a park to do it, you know. Are they, um, how are they received generally? Well, it, it, <clears throat> there, there's a huge amount of uh, variation. Some people are very open to it. Um, people who are interested in the history of, of Ireland, I find, tend to be more receptive. People who are like super, you know, very devout Catholic are being less receptive. And they may even just... You know that I've been accused of being a Satanist or crazy and such like from from my beliefs. Generally, it's based on absolutely zero understanding of what druids actually do and what they believe. Um, I think it has improved, and the people are a bit more open minded than they used than they used to be. But there's still a lot of people who they just expect you to be, you know, have a long flowing beard and or big long long hair if you're a woman and wear fancy clothes with you know celtic symbols all over them and walk around with a big drum and a big staff or maybe flowers or a wreath uh, in your hair 
uh, all very much based on sort of romantic notions about what Druidism is. Um, but then that that's not, you know, that's also true of, of other parts too, you know. Um, I remember as a kid, I used to watch this program called Kung Fu with David Carradine in. Oh, I love like, that. Oh, I loved it. But I mean, I'm sure there must be loads of like ridiculous stereotypes in that series. I mean, I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but I used to love watching that. Mm. But I mean, if you imagine you're a Chinese person and you watch that series, that's obviously made in, in America, they might be looking at that and thinking, what a load of old rubbish, you know, uh, and you're thinking how ridiculous it is. Right. Um, so I think that's a very similar situation where um, it could be applied to sort of Druidism, where people have a kind of rather foolish, romantic idea of what it is. Uh, and it's only really when you're involved in it that you actually really understand uh, how it really is. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, look at the kind of ridiculous stereotypes you see of what different countries are like, you know. Um, was that famous film, Four Weddings and a Funeral, I think, which has all these stereotypes about British English people, which they're, they're just really quite laughable. It's an entertaining film, but on a certain level, and same with Notting Hill or something like that, absolutely right. crazy and ridiculous, you know, English people don't go around sort of with, with China cups wearing bowler hats and going sorry every two seconds, you know. And in Ireland isn't full of like drunken people rolling about in the street. Right. There aren't donkeys everywhere, right. you know. It doesn't rain absolutely constantly. It, do, it does rain a lot here, but it, it isn't constant, you know. There's and people don't say top of the morning. You won't right. find a single Irish person that says that. Ever, anywhere in the whole country so i i think that's just the human condition that people yes. uh tend to uh adhere to stereotypes to a large extent because because yeah. it's, it's easy it's a lot easier than actually going and finding out what what things are really like no know? it's funny i always laughed at them too because my grandmother was born in limerick in ireland yeah, and yeah. she had such a heavy thick accent that growing up it was kind of hard to understand her but I remember her telling me stories about the banshee and the, you know mm -hmm. all these really interesting things and I, I got to learn a lot about you know the culture through her too but um, you're, you're right stereotypes exist in every country and nationality across the I mean I'm half Italian too and I, I can tell you a ton of <laughs> stereotypes for them as well yeah, yeah. But, uh, I, I, I wanted, can imagine, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted people to have some clarity on um, what it means to be a Druid today. And what would you say the amount, uh, like the population is percentage wise, like in Europe? Oh, oh, it's tiny, tiny, tiny. Is it? I would say um, I'm a member of an organization called Obod. The Order of Bards of it, some Druids, which has got, I think, na internet across the globe has around maybe twenty-five to thirty thousand members. Oh wow! So it's small. There's lots of other organisations, but I mean that's one of the biggest ones. So I mean, in Ireland, there might be, I don't know, maybe five hundred to a thousand Druids in the entire. Uh, wow, that's small country yeah probably yeah there's other pagan religions such as wicca which is a lot more popular right but that's that's quite different that's a a, a modern form of witchcraft right um and um yeah i couldn't tell you how many um there are but i mean i think in the last census there were i think ten thousand people or so who put down that they were pagans so the, the number is actually higher than that, I'd for sure. But, you know, there's a lot of pagans who wouldn't wish to, you know, write down on the form, hey, I don't know, what's your religion? They've just put other or nothing. But, I mean, I, I, you know, if you want to be generous, it might be double the amount of people who declare themselves. You know? Right. 
So do pagans believe cool. in, like, or, or druids rather, do you believe in a god or or is that against um, your principles as a druid? Mm. Well, personally, yeah, I do believe there is some kind of god, but I don't think this god is actually looks like looks like us. Mm. I'd say it's probably formless. Um, it's sort of a, I suppose you could call it a force or a, an energy that exists in in the world. I suppose you could define it as a, the creative principle. Like there, I I believe personally there are two forces in the world. There's a the force of creation, the force of destruction, a sort of duality, if you like. Which, you know, you see that in so many different forms of religions. You know, Zoroastrianism, Christianity, Judaism, etc., Islam as well. Um, but how it's actually viewed varies from one one to another. Um, so. The Hindus have an interesting idea, but they have a sort of creator god called Brahma, and they have like many, many other gods. You, there's sort of this idea of, um, I suppose, henotheism. It's called where you've got like what they call avatars, where they're, they're all aspects of the one, really. And so you can have like a hundred different gods and goddesses that represent different aspects of the divine. But essentially, you get back to one god that created the universe and everything in it. Um, in fact, you look at Egyptian religion, the, you know, the, the world was created and all the gods created afterwards by, by the creator, you know? I think most um, people think that. They, I don't think most people see God as this bearded individual floating in the ether somewhere. I think a lot of, especially adults, like that was a childhood thing that you kind of grew up with. But I think most people view God as this um, energy of force, life force. But um, it's it's interesting. Do, do most Druids believe in God or are they more mm. into the belief of the power of nature and their connection to, to nature? I would say it's a mixture, but I would say the idea of actual... Uh, a pantheon of gods is probably more popular in the modern movement. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the historical evidence uh, where people talk about druids or the ways of the druids, there is no actual real mention of of gods and uh, sort of druids within the same context. You've got stories which of there's a um, a set of people who have become sort of like gods in Ireland and also in Scotland called the Tua de Danon. But they were like a sort of mythical race that invaded Ireland. <clears throat> and uh, these gods, uh, they themselves had druids and uh, some of them were in fact uh, druids themselves. So um, you could say what's sort of happened is sort of um, some of the sort of divine aspects have been attached to these characters in the past and they've been turned into the gods of demigods mm. um so um and then you have um writings about druids which have absolutely no reference to any particular deity at all so i i would be inclined to think that probably in its earliest form um like my friend i mentioned yeah, from Wales, that this godhead was either just uh, sort of the creative principle, a sort of the source, if you like, uh, the creator, or uh, the uh, the actual force of nature itself, and you know, which could be um, embodied by the sun, the moon, the forest, the sea. Whatever, all the, all the forces of nature are be indicative of this uh, creator or, or God, if you like. Um, and like, there are some some druids who are like secular druids who don't believe in a god at all. I don't think there's any atheist druids, but I think it tends to fall into two camps. One is like like God is sort of this uh, amorphous sort of force, and then you have those that sort of are into polytheism 
Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying either, either one is correct or incorrect. I think it's, um, well, that's kind of irrelevant, really. One thing I've come to think over time is that dogma it is, is not important. How you live your life is so much more important. It's easy to say, I believe this, I believe that, uh, you know, this is the word of God, this is that, this is blah, blah, blah. But then the proof of the pudding is in the eating. At the end of the day, it's how you conduct yourself as a human being, how you treat the world, how you treat other people, which actually shows what you truly believe. Anybody can spout off at the mouth about, you should do this, you should do that, you should believe this, you should believe that, this is what you need to do. You know, I'm a messenger of God, I know everything because God spoke to me and told me you've got to do this. All that is irrelevant. It's easy to talk. Anybody can talk. Anybody can say whatever they want. And, you know, confidence merchants, you know, uh, con artists, liars, you know, spiritual leaders down the centuries and even millennia have many, some of them been proven to be crooks and, and he, you know, even murderers. Look at Jim Jones. He, he, he basically killed his entire congregation, you know, um, so I, I would say it, what you actually profess to believe and what you actually do, if those two things don't match up, uh, if, if how you treat people and you treat um, animals, how you treat the world around you, uh, you know, your friends, your family, total strangers, that, that is what is proof of whether you actually are a spiritual person or not not the words that come out of your mouth. Absolutely. What, how do Druids view evil? Where, where, like we, you know, as Christians believe, not in Satan as this horned entity, but more as like a force too. Um, how does a Druid perceive evil and, and its source? Is it just an well, individual choice or is there a force behind it? H how do Druids view that? Well, you see, this this kind of dogma isn't really clearly defined. You have like a defined sort of structure for the universe, but these kind of concepts about actually um, how the universe was created, who God is and who who like the opposite is, aren't really clearly defined in Celtic culture or Druidism, whereas they would be far more clearly defined in other parts. But you do have stories of demons and people fighting against them and fighting against evil. Um, there's a story of the children of Lear in which a demon appears in that story. You also have like this uh, demonic character called Balor who fights with the two of Devanon and he's killed um, by, by Lou, who I mentioned earlier. Very much like David Goliath uh, story where he uses a sling and he, he fires a stone right through uh, his his has uh, this huge eye that can uh, destroy people just by looking at them. He can just kind of obliterate everyone. Anyway, um, he is destroyed. You know, it's very much um, similar to the idea of Horus who uh, eliminates Seth, the evil uh, Lord of Chaos, you know the the devil figure in um, in Egyptian mythology. So you have a lot of parallels, really, in in stories where there is evil, and you have uh, sort of druids who would um, try to fight against evil. But then you also have stories where you have evil druids who do horrific things to people, where they're, they're murdered, you know. Um, there's a particular story in Kerry where this druid, his um, his king Conri is killed, and Cú Colin tries to take away his wife. The druid comes and grabs hold of her and throws himself and her off off the battlements of the fort, off the cliff, and they're both killed. You know, you know what? Uh, the, the battle was already lost. This guy's already gone. So it was just sort of, a, I suppose, vengeance, uh, a re revenge that uh, to make sure Ku Cullen couldn't couldn't have have her. 
So, and there's loads of other instances where people have been, uh, you know, horrible magic to, to trap people in a sort of tar slime, suddenly again, then be murdered and such like, and sort of druidic spells raining fire down upon people in battle, etc. So, I would say, um, in the modern sense, I would say nearly all druids would be. I suppose want to be on the the side of the light, if you like, as opposed to darkness. Mm -hmm. They would want to be on the right hand path as opposed to the left hand path. But that's that's not always the case. There would still be people who are druids even today who who uh, are quite happy to do nasty things to people if it they feel it's in their interest. Yeah. But as a general thing, I think there is an understanding in the druid community that evil does exist that is a powerful force in the world and that um it's something that you you need to make an effort to to overcome to fight against in order for the world to be a better place um it's a it's a necessary thing to take a stand against against evil yeah but uh, not everyone agrees about what evil is you know right. um you look at two countries of war, uh, you know, uh, one side will say, oh, you're evil. And the other side says, oh, you're evil. Mm -hmm. So who, who's who's right? You know, it's very it can be quite a muddied situation sometimes. Um, I think basically. I think most people do know if, they, if they've got of the right mind, they're not sort of mentally ill or mentally sort of. Um, deficient they they can define in in terms of the heart in terms of feeling about what evil is and what good is yeah. i think even you have some sense of of what that is so ultimately i think it's a, an individual choice that we all have to make do you want to be a good person and try and make the world better to try and be loving towards the world and to your fellow human beings or do you just want power and greed right. and uh, grasping for yourself and your own needs and your own desires and be prepared to do anything to get that i would say that's just a very simple definition of what yeah what evil is. have you ever seen or practiced magic where you saw it work and you were oh, like yeah. kind of blown away by that. Could you give us an example? Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, there has been instances where I've done healing work for people. I've also had to deal with uh, evil spirits, if you like, demonic forces and get rid of them. Like possessed people? Um, well, in one case, yes, someone who was afflicted by a demonic force that was at them, and uh, it took some effort to to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so did you did you perform like what what the Catholic Church would call an exorcism, or did you just use druid magic? Maybe maybe you. Uh, yeah. Well, you wouldn't call it an exorcism as such, but yeah, I had to use sort of. Um, very much part of the magic, I suppose, is not really, you're not really doing it yourself. You're invoking a higher power, if you like. You're invoking the, you know, the holy power of, of God, in, in effect, to actually right. get rid of, you know, such uh, malign forces that are afflicting somebody. You know, as an ordinary human being, I don't have the power or to do that. Uh, in a sense of the magic you learn is actually a sort of form of um, you're channeling the the force of the divine. You're, you know, human beings and ourselves, you know, we're quite limited in what, what we can do. We do have like willpower and whatever and uh, abilities. We're part of this world. But when you're dealing with sort of a metaphysical a crisis i don't think we you know we really don't uh have the strength to to do that much about that on our own That's did you why. use like herbs and things from nature 
in this ritual? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would have done things like to cleanse an area that, that's been sort of um, sullied, if you like, by yeah, made sort of uh, unclean, if you like. You can use things like uh, uh, vervain, sage, uh, rosemary, all kinds of things, frankincense to, to kind of richly cleanse uh, Sao Paulo wood. There's things you you know, from all over the world you can use, not just restricted to what you can find here in Ireland anymore. You know, you can just go on the internet and order some like Californian sage and use that as for cleansing. Uh, it's really a matter of choice. But I mean, there's so many different ways you can. Yeah. Uh, the horrible phrase of there's a, you know, many different ways to skin a cat, as I say. So I suppose what you're really interested in is the end result in how you're able to help somebody. I would, I've been asked to do uh, things that I wouldn't approve of. There was once a woman who asked me to put a spell on a guy to make him fall in love with her. Oh, jeez. And I, I refused to do it. I flatly refused to do it. I just said, look, if you want this guy to fall in love with you, go and speak to him. Go and talk right. to him. Right. You know, uh, try and get him to to notice you, to, to like your personality, uh, and you get to know him then, you know, that's going to be far, if I, even if I had done that, it wouldn't last forever. It would just last a while. And then, you know, the bubble would burst and, and it probably all come undone. So, you know, I think that's going back to ethics again. There's certain things that I, I would refuse to do. Uh, I'd be very, um, I wouldn't want to harm anyone. Uh, I suppose if someone was being, you know, in the process of being murdered, I would probably, I would, might think I would then perhaps intervene in uh, a serious way. Like to but, stop evil. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I, there's no way I'm going to ever put a curse on somebody or, or if someone wanted to, you know, pay me to do some awful thing, put, ruin someone's business, say, I would just flatly refuse to do that kind of thing. Because, um, <clears throat> yeah. um, Magic is actually quite a powerful and very real thing. I know you look at things like the Harry Potter and uh, you know Lord of the Rings. It it all looks it's fantastical and like you know you've got showmen on the right. you know uh, on the TV. It's not like that in in real life. It's a lot more subtle, and and it can often take a quite a long time to have an effect. You know you don't get this sudden instant flash of light coming out of your finger and you know it doesn't work like that that's what people are sort of expecting do you um, believe in in the karmic uh balance of that so there are folks that do use magic uh with ill intent do you believe that whole karmic thing comes to get them at the end of the day i mean oh yeah very much so that's yeah. something I first came across from uh, from Buddhism and Hinduism. I think mm -hmm. that's where the term actually comes from itself. It's borrowed from from Indian culture. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's very much something I think that does come to pass. And you've got examples of, you know, uh, transmigration of souls or mm -hmm. uh, metempsychosis called in Druidism, where people are reincarnated and you know, in the same way as a Buddhist, you could go up and down. You you could be reincarnated as a snail for punishment for something terrible you did. And I do I do very much think that in the long run, you will you will pay for the bad deeds you've done. Sometimes it's not till the end of your life. Other people, it's sort of you know a lot faster, so almost instant right. karma. Sometimes. Right. Then I I'm very much uh, believe in that principle that. Um, what you do in your lifetime, your your soul will have to pay for for all the bad that you've done. So most druids believe that as well. I would say most would have some kind of idea similar to that, if not exactly the same as the concepts of concept of karma, something of a similar nature. Yeah. So I know we talked about this before, but would you call yourself then a witch? I know you said pagan. So is there a big distinction for you between witchcraft and paganism? Yeah, well, 
paganism, paganism is an umbrella term. So Druidism is part of paganism, heathenism, shamanism, witchcraft, Wicca, they're all branches of paganism. But I, I wouldn't call myself a witch. No, I'm not. I don't, I don't use spells very much, mm. you know. Um, I suppose you do what you might call everyday magic, which is sort of like focusing of the mind, meditation, uh, sort of maybe invocation, but actually doing actual spells, you know, uh, um, that's not something I do very often. And it's sort of something when, when you have a particular reason to do something, a particular need, or someone else has a particular need that they 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 will need from you to help them that would be when i would yeah. use formal magic in terms of such using spells right uh, but most of my training um you know the first i don't know how many years of it i, I didn't learn anything about spells mm. you know that's something that come later on later when you, learn, yeah. when you become a witch you you start learning how to do spellcraft right away much. yeah you know, it's interesting because I think people um, like I see it all over the Internet, even friends of mine, they're always with positive affirmations um, and they chant them, you know, all these wonderful positive affirmations, you know, and then they're right away to condemn witchcraft or or being a druid because they look at that as something against Christ and against Catholicism. But yet, when you're repeating these affirmations, that's kind of like a little witchery to me, anyway. Well, I'm definitely not against Christ or Jesus, and not at all. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in the actual teachings of Jesus that I could criticize. Nothing at all. In fact, you could say I'd say that Jesus is a, as being an incredibly positive force in the world. Uh, I would not say the same of the Catholic Church or many of the Protestant churches. Right. Um, I mean, look at all the mayhem and death that's happened. Oh, historically, yeah. Jesus, you know? But I mean, if you if you look at what Jesus actually taught in his own words, rather as opposed to like, you know, what other people have written uh, about what he what he meant or what he believed, I think. If you just isolate his own words, then you get a very clear message that is one of love and one of uh, yes. harmony and peace and respect for for life. Absolutely. For life. And that's something very much that I am in tune with. So I would say I'm very much for Jesus. I'm just not for Christianity right. as a religion. Right. I hear you on that. So let's, in closing, talk about your books a little bit. Um, I read your book. I, I thought it was very interesting, especially towards the end when you really get into gardening and nature and all that. Why did you tell folks why you wrote this last book and what was your goal and hope in, in sharing this information? And maybe you have a hard copy because I read the PDF. You can show yeah. it. Yeah, I have it here. Uh, there you go. That's that's the book. The nice cover. Book. Yeah. Well, that was done by the publishers. I'll have to admit it wasn't my own design. Very but nice. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm very happy with it. Well, I, I've been writing for a long time, and I've written an awful lot of short-form stuff. And, you know, not everyone wants to read, like, a, a, you know, a huge book on gardening or a huge book on Druidism or spirituality so these are all relatively short so i thought it would be a good idea to collect up all these articles i've written from magazines for 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 blogs and websites etc and there's some interviews i think there's seven interviews in there too at the back um and put them all together and i obviously spent some time going sorting them out into different categories to make it easy so if you want to read about gardening there's a whole bunch sort of under the environmentalism uh you know the the different sections on druid history or on metaphysics which is basically a complex way of saying like 
how the world is put together, how the universe is. And uh, sort of, you know, moral issues as well kind of tap into that too. So I've kind of divided it up in into these um, different sections. Some of them are only like a page or two, some are a bit longer. But it, it's um, it it's also something that's sort of a progression because I, you know, the the time between the first and the last one is nineteen years, which is like a, a lunar cycle, a big, huge lunar cycle takes exactly 19 years. So I thought that was an interesting idea because uh, that's something that's very important in Druid astronomy. And uh, so I thought, well, that seems like the perfect time period for me. And there's some unpublished articles in there as well. So, you know, that you won't find anywhere else. But um I think I think it's very very easy for things to be kind of trivial. You get sort of people in paganism who who trivialize it. They're not serious. It's all just flouncing around in stupid clothes and you know people wearing fake elf ears and stuff. And in one of my pet hates is people wearing plastic ivy on their head and such like you know how what's environmental about wearing plastic flowers and plastic um you know plants right it's all like a joke and then you even you know you look at some other religions you get these people uh christian pastors who are like you got to give me the money to buy a cadillac for myself because jesus says i need a cadillac right. i mean they, those people are just as laughable as somebody they wearing are. Plastic ears, you know, and to me, uh, I think there's a lot of philosophical elements in Druidism. People don't want everything dumbed down, they don't want just sound bites all the time, they don't want like the one minute version. People want to explore spirituality, they want something that's real that. That's that you know sustenance is food for the soul, not just something that leaves you kind of half empty and sort of unsatisfied. So you know my approach to to this Druidism and just spirituality in general is is to try to be quite serious about it and uh, not to sort of um, either patronize people or sort of like trivialize. Uh, spirituality either you know I see an awful lot of that going on and I just think well ultimately we, we all have to find our way our own way in life our own way through what being a human being is and all the complexity and difficulty of it all and I think you know you would treat people like grown-ups and try and talk honestly about things and I just I try to just lay out well, how I see the world and all these different subjects uh, and be honest about what I think um, of trying to be a spiritual person and be a good person actually involves. And that's really very much at the core of what I'm trying to do is um, from what I've learned in my life, try to pass that on to other people that hopefully they'll find find it useful helpful in some way you know not that i'm like some guru or anything i'm certainly not i don't really believe in that principle of people being gurus and you know that's a real kind of a cul-de-sac for the ego you go down that road of thinking you're special that you're better than everyone else and yeah and then it becomes yeah, cold. But, you know it's like yeah. it takes on a whole cult kind of vibe and yeah, and there's far too much going on already. What I hope to do is to help people to figure things out for themselves, to, you know, to a little signpost here and there, I suppose, to help people create their own relationship with whatever they view God as. And I'm also, obviously, I'm very interested in environmentalism. I have been since I was a kid. And part of my understanding of of the world is is actually if we believe in God, if we believe in the creation as a, a wonderful thing, that, that we should look after it. We shouldn't yes. treat it with disrespect. I agree. I, I don't believe that whatever God is, 
I don't think God wants us to trap all over this planet and destroy us. Right. You know, it's our home. It was created. We've we've grown up and lived here as a species. And, you know, we, we don't have anywhere else to go. At least not, not yet. Not yet, anyway, right? <laughs> you know what's sad? Well. Right. You know what's sad, though, how politics latched on to, you know, the whole climate change topic and turned it into this whole political battle between right and left. And, you know, that that's really sad. I, I, I think that... I agree with you. I think it's been hijacked to a large right. extent. Absolutely. Um, this idea of the Green New Deal or... Uh, you know, uh, climate change has become like a, a buzzword for like right. basically bullying people. Right. And but it's, it's not ordinary people like you know, they want people to not have like a fireplace in Ireland and, you know, not be able to burn coal or wood in their own house. But it's the, the massive corporations it, here and in other countries, they actually do 90 percent of the damage to the environment is done by huge corporations that are polluting everything, putting chemicals in, into the rivers, et cetera, oh, yeah. the land, uh, d damaging the air. And yet they're coming after ordinary people with all this, oh, you've got to do this for climate change. It's 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 a bastardization of yeah, the environmental movement, as far as I can see. It's it it's it's not honest. And they think that even if we did do all those things, no ceiling fans, no gas stoves, what everyone else is doing to the globe is far worse. And the percentage that of change we make really wouldn't make that much of an impact as far as the environment anyway. So the whole thing is a political nightmare, but. Yeah, well, I think if we did all make some effort, and I do make an effort, I think yeah. it will make a small change, but I think the biggest change you can make is pressuring politicians, pressuring uh, corporations into actually putting their money where their mouth is and not just giving us a hold of BS and actually just say, right, look, I have money in my in my pocket. You want my money? Do live up to what you say you're going to do right. they, you know they, they might make these kind of crappy adverts which is sort of like su super woke advert about how they love the environment and this you know every, you know they're so green but then right. that's just that's just uh you know like a pr exercise yeah it comes down that most of them actually don't care so you know there's companies that i buy i buy cut i will not buy their products all oh, right because you know they're they're causing huge devastation. Yeah, and I think as individuals, me, I can't obviously stop like Coca Cola from stealing people's water in you know the Amazon or Mexico or whatever. But if like you know uh, a million people across the world or ten million people or whatever actually did the same thing, it's just right. I'm not buying the products. Eventually, these these companies these corporations they'll get the message yeah they do they do eventually cotton on that um the people don't like this stuff yeah they i mean you know like I, think it, I, think it, I think it starts with overconsumption too as americans like we are you know programmed to overconsume, and in that you know it's all this extra plastics because sometimes like i'll open something and it'll be a plastic inside of a plastic and clearly, you know, that frustrates me because yeah. it's it's unnecessary waste then. But I think it starts to, like you said, on an individual level. There are things we can do. Boycott these companies. Don't overconsume. You know, there's a lot we can do individually. A lot can be changed. Like when yeah. I was a kid, I remember, you know, paper bags. You had glass bottles that you took back to the oh. shop and they gave you some money back. You know, people like your granny or whatever, your mother, uh, would like have like a, a, a shopping bag made out of rope or something, you know, yeah. those kind of things or, or like a cloth bag. Um, Everything worked, you know. Yeah. I, I don't remember seeing shops with nothing in, you know. They had products exactly like now, except 
you know, your cheese may have been wrapped up in like grease proof paper instead of in plastic, you know? So, I mean, all these solutions to a lot of these problems are already there. The reason that the world is flooded with plastic is because it's cheap. It's really cheap. And these corporations, they're doing it because it saves them money and they make a lot more profit. Right. And so they're, they're just lying to us when they say they care. What they care about is the bottom line and how That's much profit. Right. That's right. That's so true, Luke. My gosh. Well, it was such a pleasure speaking with you. And I know we went past the hour and I appreciate that. Um, of course, I will have links to your website, which is lukeeastwood.com, correct? Yeah. That's it. And you got all your books on there. How many books have you written, Luke? Uh, 10. 10 now. I'm working on the 11th at the moment. Oh, uh, nice. Kind of top secret for now, anyway. <laughs> I will definitely have links in the description as well to where folks can um, purchase your book. It's on Amazon too, right? Yeah, it's on all the usual booksellers, I think, you know, and yeah. some bookshops too. But I generally try to encourage people to go and get it from their local bookshop if possible. That's you nice. Know, I like to support yeah. local businesses if I can, and I Absolutely. encourage other people to do the same too. Absolutely. Well, I hope we can cross paths again. I still have a bunch of questions that I didn't get to ask you. So hopefully. Well, the road. Yeah, I'd love to come back at some point. Um, and thank you so much for having me on. It's been great fun talking to you. Oh, same here. Thank you so much, Luke. And I will be in touch again moving forward. Thank, thank you. you.